welcome to episode three of the Farm One podcast. On these episodes, we'll be talking through updates from the farm, we'll be having interview guests, and we'll talk about what's in this week's boxes for our Farm Share program. My name is Ina Tubalaiha, Chief of Staff at Farm One. Joined with us is Jess Carroll. Hi, I'm the Technical Director at Farm One. I um, help fix things, I help design things, and I help build software. And I'm Rob Lang, I'm the CEO and founder of Farm One. I'm Michael Chin, Vice President of Corporate Development, and I work on our growth initiatives. Good. How's everyone's weekends? Oh, pretty good. Um, what did we do? Uh, they all sort of seem to blur into each other. <laughs> but I watched this amazing documentary about um, a startup called Makani, M-A-K-A-N-I, which was a Google X uh, project to capture wind power using kites instead of uh, wind turbines. and. Mm -hmm. and by kites, they sort of mean massive wings that are rigid wings that they suspend um, or, or that fly around somewhat autonomously. Pretty crazy stuff. I don't know if you, have you seen any of that? No. Yeah, no. it's worth checking out if you're into engineering, startups, really, really difficult things. Um, and they've actually open sourced a lot of their designs. So if you're like an engineering nerd, you might really want to geek out on this stuff. It's very, very cool. Unfortunately, they didn't succeed uh, as a company, but um, you know, all the engineering know-how they've gathered is now available. Yeah. I love thinking about a future of clean energy. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I spent my weekend thinking about something similar actually with uh, capturing energy from stormwater uh, channels and converting it into uh, power for, for Highlands, New Jersey. So oh, very, very, cool. very related. Okay. Nice. Awesome. I had a very long run on Sunday, nine miles. I'm not sure what I'm training for, but I'm just excited to see how far I can run. Yeah. And then I watched David Attenborough's oh, Life on This Planet, and now I'm really sad and disappointed about the world. His uh, daughter was my primary school teacher. No way. Yeah. Oh we didn't goodness. get on. <laughs> I really like him, but we didn't get on. I'm pretty sure we would get on now. I was probably just a bad kid, but... Uh, <laughs> That's my claim to fame. Yeah, what about you, Michael? Well, I've been making my way through Kingdom on Netflix, which is a uh, Korean zombie oh, okay. series. So if you have any interest in a, in a potential pandemic uh, of, of zombies, uh, that's a good watch. Okay, it's quite an upgrade from the COVID pandemic. Awesome. Well, thank you all for joining us today. The first segment that we're going to get started with is sharing what's in this week's bag for our farm share. Um, on this segment, we'll walk through the three containers that each of our customers will be receiving and which new varieties they're going to get to try. We're going to start off with our herbs and edible flowers box. So you'll see a lot of the purple flowers. Those are violas this week. Um, this week, the box features um, assorted violas, um, nepi tela flowers, which are these small purple flowers. I'm not sure if you can see them very well. Oh, there yeah. we go. I can assist if you want. Thank you. Thank you. That's helping. Um, and then we also have some marigold flowers, which are these orange ones. Mm, this smells so good. OK. What's the basil? We have some cinnamon basil here nice. this week. And we also have Rao Ram, which is Vietnamese coriander, has a very strong cilantro flavor. Stuff is so good. If you're mm. making like a pho or if you're not that sophisticated and you're just frying some noodles and stuff, it's still <laughs> great. You don't need to do a fancy dish. Um, and then also what we're trying to do right now is like, we're trying to sort of uh, make the box better every week, but also we're trying to separate out some of these things. So what we're using actually to do that is these popcorn shoots. Uh, so it's sort of this like eco-friendly uh, biodegradable way, but you can eat these as well, can't you? Yeah, they have a sweet yeah. flavor to them. Yeah, great. So um, yeah, every week we're just trying to make this package better and better. This one we put on a bed of these um, yarrow leaves as yeah. well. Wow, yarrow is great. It's like a antibacterial uh, kind of herbal remedy for if you're out in the forest and you cut yourself, you should find <laughs> some yarrow as soon as you can. They used that in the Civil War. Oh, they did? Yeah, okay. during the United States Civil War, they used yarrow leaves to help oh, treat um, battle wounds. All right, how'd it work <laughs> out? Oh, wow. <laughs> 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 well, what, I'm hey, not sure. Do you guys have tips on what to do with flowers? Oh, 
Well, I mean, I tend to use them if I've made something nice for my girlfriend and I just want to make it look extra special, I'll just pop some flowers on. I mean, li literally as simple as that, but I think they work really nicely in little cocktails as well. They just seem to sort of elevate any, almost anything you do with some flowers on, it's going to look better. I think maybe like a burger and fries is going to not really experience much of a lift, but, um, but yeah, you can, you know, if you were doing a little granola bowl or you're doing like overnight oats even, and you wanted to surprise someone with it. I think they're really nice if you live with someone and you want to just give someone a little nice moment in the day, like a couple of little flowers on something. It's just super nice, yeah. right? Yeah, and yeah. I like to use the marigold leaves or the marigold um, flowers yeah. to make a tea. So I'll infuse that with some mint leaves. So mint and marigold tea. The, yeah. To me, the flowers take a dish from like just a normal dish to I got to take a photo of this. like instantly and, yeah no you're um, right and the nepotella ones as well they're so small but if you haven't smelled these before they're really fragrant you know and so they've got this minty aroma um i can smell them right now just by even just touching them you know so things like that are just really really fun and i i think like yeah everyone should have a little joy in their life and that's what <laughs> flowers are for there you go Thank you. Awesome. So next? the next box that we'll walk through is our microgreens. So this mix here features three types of microgreens. We have micro broccoli, micro rambo radish, and red streak mizuna. I think the favorite one that I have in this one is the micro rambo radish. It has a nice little spice to it and adds Amazing. a little bit of spice to your salads. Really good. Is it rambo or rainbow? Rambo. Rambo. Wow, I've never heard of that. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because it's sort of, you know, not like this military superhero <laughs> guy, but um, <laughs> they grow really fast and they're really tasty. Oh, these are so good. Mm. So that's the yellow box. Easy way to get your greens. Mm -hmm. And the third box that we have is our baby greens. And this actually has a mix of four different types of baby greens. We have red kale very easily di identifiable with its dark leaves. We have Toscano kale, baby red Mizuna, which is the first time our customers are gonna be trying that this week, and a five-star five star lettuce mix. Awesome. Yeah, and like, you know, just to sort of explain to people who don't get this already, right? So this is coming in a reusable container. Uh, it's really sturdy. Uh, they stack really nicely in your fridge as well. So if you're looking at these and you're thinking like, oh my God, I don't have space in my tiny little New York apartment. Uh, this actually fit pretty well. They fit in my fridge and I've still got a bit of space to spare when I put them in. Um, you can wash them yourselves or just return them to us without washing if you want, up to you. Um, and then we sterilize them and, and wash them in our commercial dishwasher um, and return them back again. So they're just staying reused in the system, which I think is going to, be a topic we talk about in a few minutes as well, but really, really nice. And, and they stay super fresh. So, you know, we obviously harvest and deliver same day. So within just a couple of hours of harvest, you're going to get this coming to your door, um, which if you compare that to like a normal salad greens in the supermarket, which could be several days old, this is like super, super, super fresh and you can tell. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited about it. And we get some really nice feedback, right, from the customers. Yeah, definitely. I Ina think... talks to customers all the time. <laughs> I think that one thing that's great about these containers also, not only do they help prevent plastics from entering the waste stream, but it helps keep the produce so fresh. You know, yeah. I had greens two weeks ago that I'm still enjoying, and I can't believe how fresh they still are. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for talking us through that segment. Um, the next segment that we're going to go into is we're going to be talking about some news and updates from the vertical farming industry. Michael typically identifies a couple of news articles and we all share around news articles to each other and the team about things that we find interesting that are happening in the industry. And we're here to talk through some of that. Michael, do you want to share some of the things that you found this week? Yeah, yeah. So there are a couple of topics um, that I thought were interesting for, for our discussion. I'm going to start with the first one. So uh, I think sometime last week, McDonald's announced uh, that they're going to be doing a uh, mech plant. Um, so apparently they've been piloting a PLT with uh, Beyond Meats in Canada. 
uh, for a while last year, and they cut that, uh, it sounded like, around spring of this year. And they announced that they're going to be doing their plant-based uh, meat alternative protein um, uh, coming soon, I think. Um, so this is a pretty interesting topic, right? So we've got now, for a while, uh, Impossible, uh, which, which is another plant-based uh, protein alternative uh, business um, that uh, was working with Burger King on the Impossible Whopper. Um, Pizza Hut has also announced that they're working with Beyond uh, to do plant-based uh, alternative uh, toppings. Um, which I thought was kind of funny. They were doing the Beyond Impo Beyond Italian Sausage Pizza and the Great Beyond Pizza. <laughs> They're doing that nationwide. <laughs> uh, I don't know who names this stuff or PLT. Um, you know, so you name it, so doing it. Beyond's working with Subway, KFC, Taco Bell. You've probably seen uh, Impossible's products at uh, Whole Foods and other supermarkets. And um, there's a lot here that's kind of interesting. Right. It's, it, is this sort of yet another, you know, new thing that everyone's all hyped about or, you know, is this going to be is this going to be a big, big market? Uh, you know, there's some estimates that it's a, a 35 billion dollar market by 2027. Um, but there's just a lot to this. Right. It's uh, they are claiming uh, sustainability. They're claiming a resilient supply chain, uh, all these types of topics. Um, that they're linking to plant-based alternatives. So um, what are your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on, on where this is going? Is it real? What does it mean that a McDonald's and a Burger King and a KFC and others are, are jumping on board? Um, yeah, so I think it's an extremely exciting space. Um, the uh, meat production industry is definitely the worst uh, performer in terms of carbon emissions and uh, effluent and all these other um, environmental problems among the food sector industries. And I think, um, you know, in traditional um, meat production, you normally grow the feed, uh, you know, like corn or other grains in a field, and then you have to use basically the animal to convert that into um, food. Whereas with uh, plant-based meats, of course, you're skipping that whole um, secondary system where there's a significant amount of loss. Um, and I think there is uh, a big potential for um, at least environmental gains to be had from switching to plant-based meats. Um, and so I think it could really definitely have a significant environmental impact at the very least. Yeah, I mean, that's what we're all you know hoping for, I think. And um, I, th I think the thing that's been surprising to me actually has been seeing this wider adoption of plant-based plant -based meats uh, <laughs> across the country and, you know, seeing these products get into communities and situations which you would say were definitely far from like coastal elites, far from, you know, high percentage of vegetarians or, or vegans or that kind of thing. And you're seeing like this wider and wider adoption. And it's been, I, I think, incredibly impressive. And if you had asked me, you know, six or seven years ago, like, is this going to happen as fast? I probably would have said, no, I don't think it will, because I think people would take longer. But uh, I think people are clearly keen on this stuff. And, you know, the other thing is for if you, you know, if you're McDonald's and you see this kind of potential out there, um, it seems like, you know, it's just a really good bet for them because actually it's a simpler supply chain for them. It's, you know, more environmentally friendly from a food safety perspective. It's a lot easier, you know. Um, because if you look at the food safety implications of creating a processed plant product versus creating a processed meat product, you, you eliminate sort of 95% of the potential contaminants and pathogens and, and problems and that kind of thing. So, so I think that's really great. And I, I think that, um, you know, one of the exciting things about this, and maybe we'll get onto cultured meat a little bit later on, but, uh, is that actually the price point obviously of these pretty good plant-based meat alternatives has come down and down and down. And so. You know, I, I heard a quote recently that was estimating that when Impossible tried its first burgers, you know, the first plant-based burgers um, in a select group of restaurants, it cost them about $100 per patty to supply this thing. I remember going into Momofuku Nishi at the time and trying one of these things for the first time. This is back in 2017, I, I guess. Um, you know, that was expensive. It was expensive stuff and it was only served in a few restaurants. And now 
that kind of tech uh, has filtered down to the level where it's at a really, really low price point. And if McDonald's can do it uh, at scale at the price of a McDonald's hamburger or something, then I think we're in a really great place. And I think, you know, personally, I think that this is where a lot of kind of low quality meats can be replaced. You know, meats that are in frozen pizzas, frozen lasagna, meats that, you know, people are consuming as meat more out of habit than, or, or necessity, I guess, rather than wanting to have like a, a steak or something like that. Yeah. And so I think this is a really exciting uh, kind of time. And to build off that point, I think um, this, the agriculture practices that are used for those more low quality meats, which now it seems like the plant-based meats have the potential to replace, were the most um, harmful to the environment. Um, the you know grazed cattle and more regenerative practices that were the high end meat that it seemed like at first that the plant based meats might be replacing doesn't actually seem like where the majority of the benefits are that you would get from replacing that um, that material. Yeah, yeah. I hope that this is just like step A of the whole alphabet of things that these kinds of companies are going to do because this is something that doesn't have to change the consumer's behavior. Right. And I think that there's still a lot more issues that follow, you know, be through the rest of the alphabet that consumers have to seek out fresher food from directly from the farm or directly from its source. So even though I'm excited about this kind of plant based change and there are definitely benefits to that, there's going to be a lot less cows on the planet, I hope. Um, but I, I definitely am eager to see more changes um, follow on. You know, I personally don't like the plant based meats. It doesn't I, I used to eat meat a while back and mm. the plant-based meats just don't taste good for me. <laughs> yeah. So I don't like, I, you know, there, there's more that I, I, I hope, you know, there's more that I hope to see after this kind of replacement in menus like that. Yeah. I think it'll happen. I don't know. What's your opinion, Mike, Michael? Cause you know, maybe you got a different take. I don't know. Yeah. Hopefully uh, the cows that we do have on the planet just live better lives. Cause to me, you know, as someone who does eat meat and, and admittedly a fair amount of it, um, that, that's probably been the most difficult thing uh, for me to wrap my head around. Um, I'm very fortunate in that I'm able to source meat direct from farms and, you know, a farm like Polyface down in Virginia, uh, where their practices are, are um, A, sort of, you know, just they treat their animals really well. Um, and B, environmentally, and Jess, this is a big topic for Jess, um, they've been strong proponents of regenerative agriculture for a while. Um, I guess, you know, for me, it's, it's the thing that I'm trying to get my head around is, are we as humans and, and as a society that difficult to deal with that we've got to call it plant-based meat? You know, we can't think of it as, as you know, eat more plants, you know, is like go out and get more broccoli, get more spinach and uh, get more, you know, beans and high fiber uh, uh, plants into your diet. We've got to come up with this highly processed protein version of a plant that looks like a burger in order <laughs> for people to be like, OK, great. Yeah. You know, let's do good stuff here. Um and maybe it's a question of, OK, you know, how do we change consumer habits? How do we change it at scale? Does it take something like a McDonald's or a Burger King and, and others where, you know, frankly, and I don't mean to be rude about this to anybody who enjoys those types of meals, but, you know, that's not really food, right? It's like stuff to put in your stomach. There's not much nutrition in it. Um, I guess it's full of flavor, which, you know, if you're going to make a plant based product, something that's appetizing yeah sure it's it's a protein molecule that you know has all sorts of seasonings and flavors and in, in it so that it tastes like a, a big mac or or a whopper um but um I, I guess that's the thing that i'm struggling with is it how do is this the way that we get through to consumers or you know are there other approaches and and kind of on that whole spectrum of things um you know where where can this fit in uh, I think that's a really interesting point because um, I think one sort of criticism of the plant-based meat uh, products are that they're not necessarily like healthy. They're not like eating vegetables, really. Um, they're just sort of taste like meat without the environmental impacts of meat, um, or at least some of them. Uh, so can we move to a place where, you know, it tastes like meat and is healthy like for you like vegetables or um, 
is that just not possible? Uh, I think I think it's you know a separate component of the plant based meat industry that hasn't been really tackled. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I go back and forth on whether whether I believe consumer behavior can actually change, you know, and and so I'm personally somewhat happy with saying, OK, there's this product on the market now for people to shift the environmental impact of their diet. They do not have to change. And if they want to change, there's also this whole world of vegetables and real food out there. But but we don't I guess what we're not what we don't have to do is force someone to change the kind of things they eat, as well as the ingredients that are within them, you know? And I, I think that's a good thing. Um, but yeah, I think there is this other underlying problem and you see it, you know, in obesity rates and diabetes and heart disease and all kinds of other related lifestyle illnesses that plague Western societies. It's like, there's just a fundamental problem with the th things that everybody eats. Um, yeah, I just, I, I, I think it's good that we can decouple the two things because obviously you know, these plant-based meats can get adopted very, very quickly. I think there's a longer term conversation that starts at like school. It starts at home about what do we eat? How do we eat it? Where do we get it from? Can people cook for themselves? Is there, you know, are they eating whole foods and all this kind of stuff? Um, but yeah, like, I think that's, that's probably going to take 50 years. I don't know. <laughs> that even sounds optimistic. I don't know. Um, whereas this might take, you know, just, just five or 10 years for, for people to maybe switch to predominantly plant-based meat alternatives, you know? Could so there, there's a, you know, big push from, um, you know, big meat companies to stop um, cell-based meat or plant-based meat from being called meat. It was similar with the, uh, you know, almond milk and that type of thing. And ultimately, um, you know, you can still buy something that's called almond milk. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that will play, if for instance, it's not allowed to be called meat, play into the consumer adoption or is it sort of irrelevant? I see it a little bit like Trump contesting, you know, vote counts in Georgia or something like that. I, I mean, for me, it's a it's a distraction. And I think in some jurisdictions, you can see in some parts of Europe that has been successful. You, the manufacturers have had to change, you know, the nomenclature. I think in other areas, it won't be as successful. I, I don't think that's actually going to stop because, you know, first of all, you'll see companies like Tyson investing in these meat alternatives anyway. So they like a lot of these companies like recognize that they have to be part of this new solution, I think. And I think otherwise it's attractive for the consumer. It's attractive for the uh, supply chain. It's attractive, you know, um, well, I guess for the society, right, to support this kind of stuff. So I don't know. I don't think that's going to stop it in the long term, but um, I don't know. Maybe everyone else thinks differently, but I, I just think it's a distraction, you know. What do you think? So where does, I'm sorry, I know you're going to say something. No, no, go ahead. Okay. Uh, where does lab grown meats fit into this? Uh, well, I mean, lab grown meats are still, you know, not a scaled product at this point. Um, I mean, so there's a long way to go in product development. I think uh, right now the or you know, about now the price per serving of uh, lab-grown meat is fifty dollars or so. But the concept that you can eat a you know real animal meat without killing an animal is insanely cool, and I think um, you know has even bigger potential than plant-based meat. Honestly, um, it it could be something that completely replaces um, you know uh, cattle. Uh, in that whole process because it is essentially the same product. Um, so I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think there's a huge amount of potential there. I think the price point will come down. It's inevitable. It's like solar. It's sort of like, you know, dramatically dropped in price over the last 40 years. You know, LEDs have done a similar thing, which is why we're able to have a farm like this. I think lab grown meat, it's only going to get more and more cheap and, and more and more productive prevalent. I think there is a question about, you know, what it looks like in the sort of premium meat form factor, which is a weird phrase, but like, you know, for the people who want to buy a Kobe beef or they want to buy a duck or they want to buy, you know, something like that, where the whole item, you know, the physical structure, how it cooks, like fat, all that kind of stuff, that is like a key part of it. And so I think it, it seems inevitable that in 20 or 30 years, you will be able to reproduce like a perfect duck breast or something like that in a lab grown setting. And I think at that point, then you've got a full suite 
of options. You know, you've got a premium option, which is maybe lab grown. You've got a, uh, a lower cost option, which may be purely plant based. There may be even, I don't know, some some combination of the two, you know, technology wise. If you look at how these things are constructed, they don't all necessarily need to be, you know, cells growing upon cells. And so I, I think it's great to have all those options there. You know, personally, I wouldn't I don't think I would eat the lab grown meat, but that's my personal preference. I think there'll be a lot of people out there who, if they could eat lab grown meat and it tasted as good and it was, um, you know, the same form factor cooked the same, like they'd be super excited about it. So it seems like a winner. I love the idea of the environmental benefits of this, but then do you get that sense of connection to lab grown meat the way that, you know, I would with a farm grown animal? I don't know. Well, they've done these demonstrations where they present the chicken from a cell grown um, meat process and the live chicken in the same like room. So you're eating this chicken that's still alive. And <laughs> so <laughs> from that from that perspective, like the connection is, you know, even greater to a live animal. But um, I don't know, I think and from my personal perspective, plant based meat doesn't have the potential to completely replace animal agriculture, but cell grown meat might. So in that sense, it's, it's, you know, really transformational change. Yeah. I think a lot of people don't want that connection to the farm animal, right? Like most people actually don't want to think about right. a pig dying or they want, don't want to think about a chicken hanging from a, you know, conveyor belt in an abattoir. They don't want to think about it. So I, I think that's actually an attraction, you know, yeah. in some ways. Yeah, totally. Yeah. That makes sense. So maybe down the road, there's a, there's a, a, a farm in your city, like a farm one, except growing cells of uh, meat protein. That you can could go be. Visit. I don't see us doing that anytime soon. But it could be, could be. The top yeah. rack over there actually has it. <laughs> we got some lamb chops there behind you. Okay. Um, well, I, I, I'm guessing this isn't going to go away. It is interesting though, because you know the the reality is is that we're we're dealing with a climate crisis. Um, agriculture in in its various forms is contributing, um, but we're also dealing with a pretty significant population growth. You know, we're we're what at around seven billion now, and forecasts are headed to ten billion in the next you know you name it decades. Uh, we've got to figure out a way to do this sustainably, or or not at all, um, as may be the case. So uh, we'll keep an eye on this. It's it's pretty interesting. I don't know. I'm kind of inspired to give it a shot. Um, you know, plant-based food is in around. It's uh, in Asian culture. You've got, you know, all various forms of tofu and substitute meats that have been around for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's possible to make it delicious. Yeah. Um, okay, so the next topic, um, uh, and, and we'll get into Jess's background in a little bit, but uh, this is one that I think is quite uh, near and dear to his heart in many ways, uh, as, as the rest of us. But uh, again, a couple of weeks ago, the uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation uh, reported their, released their Global Commitment 2020 Progress Report. Um, and a little bit of background into that, uh, member uh, uh, companies, businesses, as well as countries sign on to this pledge. And the idea is that together um, they uh, uh, want to reduce uh, or, or increase recycled content in the supply chain, uh, in consumer packaged products and, and, and others by 20 percent. Um, Unfortunately, the report's highlighting that they're pretty far off of hitting that target. Um, while we're seeing an increase in the incorporation of recycled content in plastic packaging, um, we're not really seeing much movement in terms of uh, the, the reuse of that packaging. So in other words, I think what the report is saying uh, it's a win that more and more of these CPG companies are using recycled plastic in their packaging. But on the other end of the supply chain, we're not seeing a ton of movement into recycling that. So the result of that are, you know, these, uh, what do you call those plastic streams of waste? And in the U.S. alone, uh, you know, I think we're barely recycling any. And uh, we were shipping off most of our recyclables to countries like China and, and Indonesia and Malaysia to process. Um, how bad is this, guys? Well, I think it's pretty bad. So uh, I guess just to take a step back, um, 
you know, our economy is built on like few other things, uh, plastic as an enabler. I think um, it's allowed, you know, the food industry to scale, um, you know, packaged foods uh, become so much cheaper and easier to transport with the use of plastics. Plastics is ubiquitous across every industry. And up until recently, people have just been thinking about plastics as uh, you know, a linear process, taking it from virgin stock, from petroleums, and ending it up in a landfill. And I think, you know, as the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and many others have realized is recycling, you know, really isn't the solution to this giant problem. There's so much plastic waste entering the ocean, which is causing tremendous harm to those marine ecosystems. Um, and, you know, by uh, 2030, the amount of plastic on the market is expected to double and the amount of plastic entering the ocean or in the ocean is supposed to quadruple. Um, so it's, it's a significant problem. And I think every company should have a responsibility to think about their plastic use. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I can comment on it as someone who's sort of been quite heavily involved in, you know, some projects with various companies to do with plastics and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's one of these issues, which I think, um, you know, if, if you, if you go back literally five years or so ago, most people would not be that conscious about the scale of the issue. Um, and, you know, there's been, we talked about David Attenborough briefly, right? One of the, you know, shots that he or his team took of, of turtles, you know, swimming around the ocean surrounded by plastic waste was actually one of the things that was like really, really instructive to people about how bad this problem was. And I think that has created a lot of pressure over the past couple of years, which is great. And it's caused companies like Nestle, like Unilever to make various slightly different targets, but mostly about dramatically increasing the level of recycling of their products, switching over to biodegradable packaging, switching over to reusables. And some of them have set some quite aggressive targets by 2030, you know, this, by 2025, this. Um, you know, the way I see it when I talk to people within those companies and, you know, those large companies tend to have pretty serious sustainability teams. They have people on those teams who are, you know, really experienced and pretty able and, and competent and very, very driven to fix this stuff. But the problem is it's a huge, huge, huge issue that affects every part of their business. If you're a consumer product uh, company, you know, it affects packaging, it affects distribution, it affects your marketing, it affects every really part of that. And then, you know, in, in every region, it's different, you know, and so, I think that what may seem to be a simple thing to, for, you know, for a consumer, it's, it's like simple. It's like, oh, you got to you got to fix that. <laughs> well, then the moment you drill into it, it becomes incredibly, incredibly difficult. I had a, a pretty good conversation with, you know, one of the bad guys. I think it was a guy from Dow Chemical um, on a bus actually at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation Summit like a year and a half ago, I think it was. And he was talking about the difficulties of getting a, um, I don't know if you know those laundry detergent, like pouches for refillable, you know, the, the pouches that are cheaper. And he was talking about the difficulty of taking that and turning that into recyclable material. Because what you've got there is you've got a, a package which has multi-level plastics. One of them might be to stop water getting in and out. Another one might be to printing on, to print onto. One of them might be for stability for the package. So you've got, you end up with like seven or eight layers, right? And, you know, the problem is if you want to make that recyclable, you've got to eliminate lots and lots of layers. And then you've got to have one layer that sort of does all of this stuff at once. And what he was saying was, look, they managed to do this for this particular package over several years to get the number of layers down, uh, to get it to, to be recyclable. But what happened was, this was now a material which would go through the packaging machines half the speed or one fifth of the speed sometimes. So if you wanted to produce 50,000 of these packages, you needed either more machines or you needed to take twice as long, you know? And that's not something that is unsolvable, right? But it shows how this, this thing becomes more complex the more you look at it. And so I, I think, you know, for me, when I look at it, some days I wake up and I go like, oh, this is going to be OK. We're going to fix this. We've got lots of you know, initiatives going on. And then the next day I wake up and I look at the same data and I kind of go like, oh, my God, you know, it's not. And I think you probably feel the same way. It's like this kind of roller coaster of like solution, 
problem, solution, problem, or maybe you're more stable than I am, Jess, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. But, but, but uh, just, just to finish to say, I think that overall, from a macro perspective, we are seeing that consumer opinion on this has shifted very dramatically. I think companies have started to see it as a corporate brand risk. You know, if Nestle bottles are turning up in rivers in Indonesia with Nestle logos on them, that is becoming untenable, you know, for a company. And I think that a lot of these things are going to take years and years and years to fix. But the movement now was sort of uh, slightly over the edge of the inflection point and it will get better and better. But I think, you know, perception wise, plastic in the ocean wise, it will get a lot worse before it starts to get fixed, but it will get fixed you know, over the next couple of decades. It's, it's a super depressing problem, but I think there's super smart people working on it. And I think, um, I hope for a solution, but sorry, I know I've been talking for a long time. The last thing I will say though is this is, this is really fundamentally the reason why we use reusables uh, now in our subscription, because really the solution is, okay, if you have to have a recyclable product and you're confident it will be recycled, okay. If you're really confident something's right, biodegradable, okay. But the better solution is to do a reusable product. This is a plastic container, but it will be used hundreds and hundreds of times. Um, and that is a, a huge, huge win. I think, um, you know, you can look at this whole issue as, you know, a significant problem, but you can also look at it as an opportunity. And I think not only is this reusable container um, able to, you know, be used many, many times reducing the amount of plastic going into the waste stream. But as Ina mentioned earlier, it keeps the product more fresh. When you do go to recycle this product, it's a much higher grade plastic and can actually be converted back into um, maybe yeah, even the same pricing. product. Yeah. Most, most plastic gets downcycled, but something of this quality might be able to stay the same quality, especially yeah. because there's no dyes. And I think um, one of the, well, there's a little bit of dye on the coin. Here. Well, this will break off, but yeah. 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 And this comes off, of course, yeah. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that Rob was mentioning about, um, about this product that he was talking to this guy about was these hybrid plastics. I think companies need to get better at thinking about what happens after at the end of the life cycle of a piece of material that they're creating before they release it into the market. Um, and I know I had one person call these materials monstrous hybrids because they just mm. cannot be recycled and easily and end up, you know, really damaging our environment. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the, you know, the, and the other thing I think that is is sort of interesting about what we're doing and what other companies are doing. So we we've talked about Deliver Zero a couple of times. Jess, you put me onto that company. They do a reusable takeout uh, delivery packaging service in New York. There's companies like us. And I think you know if you think about this concept of circular economy, which I I think most people will have heard of, but it's it's still a sort of unfamiliar phrase to some people. The idea is that you keep these materials in use and you can make that very, very complicated or you can make it quite simple, which is that, you know, companies like us can deliver something in a package. They take the package back again when it's being used and there's no waste to the environment. And that's a great example of a circular economy, but it means that you have to have a direct collection to your customer or you have a, uh, a very you know, comprehensive way of tracking all these materials, which, you know, a lot of companies are not used to doing. So it requ requires this mindset change and that, you know, that takes a lot of time as well. Um, but, but I think we'll get there. And I think that there's lots of innovation around this and it's an, you know, I think it's a great place to start a company, you know, is around some of these issues around, you know, plastic reuse and logistics and, and all that kind of thing. It's, there's lots and lots of opportunities there. I right, definitely know I that think... roller coaster that you were talking about. Like, I woke up this morning right. feeling so depressed about this problem. I right. was like, I'm going to be outraged <laughs> if I see a plastic water bottle on the street. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 100%. and I, I, I think some of the economics that are driving this are, are, are probably put startups and, and newer companies and smaller, more agile companies in the driver's seat for innovation. You know, what we're seeing, it, it, there's, there's a thread. Of, of conversation that's sort of, you know, pointing towards uh, the petrochemical industry, oil and gas, right? Where, you know, they're seeing the demand for fossil fuels because of alternatives uh, from renewables and others, um, they're seeing their core markets start to go away. So where do they turn to? It was sort of, um, 
uh, you know, they're starting to turn to uh, producing more and more plastics and flooding the market with those. And because of the scale of that, they're they're able to keep or uh, keep the keep the price and cost of virgin plastics really low. So then the choice for a Pepsi or a Coke or Unilever comes quite obvious, right? When you're go running a business like a Pepsi and a, and a Coke that's so competitive where the margins are so thin, where every quarter you're struggling to meet a couple of percent growth, taking a hit to, to uh, go for more expensive or uh, you know making the courageous bet and, and, and investment uh, into recycled uh, plastics is 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 going to be a real hit on your bottom line, um, and you know changes the economics of that pretty dramatically. Whereas newer companies, you know, like us, um, we've talked a lot about Wally Shop and what they're trying to do, uh, where they're selling you know essentially bulk items but in reusable and returnable uh, packaging. Um, models like that, I think, become really interesting. Uh, obviously, it's a question of scale. Um, but to me, that seems where we're going to see uh, a lot more movement and, and where it gets really interesting. Yeah, yeah, 100 percent. I you know, I think it's, it's this concept of like, how do you price in sustainability to a company's you know, market cap? Or how do you look at their shares in terms of their sustainability practices? And I think, you know, you're probably just more of an expert on this, but I think gradually this this supposed saving of cost of using virgin practice plastic versus a recyclable product is is not going to be a saving for much yeah. longer because it's it's going to be part of your sustainability picture as a company which is going to become more and more important i hope yeah I, I was going to say the same thing i think it become it comes down to a sustainability management problem for these businesses and rob earlier mentioned you know there's a reputational risk which is essentially a cost for that business that um you know comes about with taking reckless uh, decisions about using virgin plastics. Um, but I think one of the you know, really big things is that all the science shows that we can't continue in this direction. And sooner rather than later, there's gonna be some heavy regulations that um, hit, uh, impede companies from continuing the same practices that they're, they're on now. Um, and I think if you don't get started on building up a sustainable supply chain, uh, you know, deploying sustainable packaging, start incorporating some more of these circular economy business models into your company's business, you're going to be behind and at a severe disadvantage when uh, you know, the day of reckoning comes, basically. <laughs> Watch out. I, you know, the economics around it is very interesting because when we were considering the reusable packaging, you know, based off of just one person's, one customer for a year, we would save 90% in cost savings just mm -hmm. from transitioning to this reusable packaging model. But it works for us because we're having a direct interaction with our customers on a weekly basis. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the funny like flip side of that is like, I remember when we started to introduce uh, reusable packaging for our chef sales a while ago, and actually it was cheaper for us, but some of our farm workers didn't like it because they had to like wash the package and store it correctly and they had to make space to dry. And it was operationally, it was actually a pain, you know? Um, but we believed in it and we tried to do it. And so they, it, it can go both ways, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm looking forward to seeing how we and companies like us continue to innovate on this and, and put some options and alternatives out there. I mean, we may not get it right all the time with this, um, but, you know, we're, we're trying. And, you know, even with the reusable packaging that we have, it was really a question of, um, looking for the operational processes that made it make sense. Uh, and it's possible. You know, I think we're proving that it is possible even for a company of, of our size to be able to offer a pretty good alternative um, to it. So, yeah, and I, um, I think, um, oh, sorry. Well, th there'll no, be a lot more of these uh, circular economy enabling businesses that start um, popping up like Loop and other things that uh, help businesses uh, create you know, a packaging program like what we did or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, just to wrap this up, I was just listening to uh, a Silicon Valley investor on Kara Swisher's podcast. And uh, his thing is that uh, he thinks the first trillionaire on the planet's going to come out of the climate crisis. So 
Yeah, I was listening to the same thing. He's also got a COVID testing machine, right? So that he can uh, <laughs> play poker with his friends. He's got a COVID testing machine at his house. Um, yeah, I guess he really likes that. poker. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, all, th uh, all three of you, for that engaging discussion about the news in the farming and vertical farming industry. Uh, the next segment that we're going to go to is actually an interview with our special guest, Jess, our technical director. Thank you for joining us this week. Happy to be here. Jess, can you just share a little bit about what your position is here at Farm One and what your a typical day for you is like? Uh, yeah, so um, yeah, as Ina mentioned, I'm the technical director and I work on a combination of software systems and um, the physical farming systems. Uh, so, you know, my time is split between um, helping to, you know, improve the, the quality of the equipment, to reduce downtime, to increase the uh, efficiency of, you know, the processes that um, are happening here every day on the farm. Um, and then also to build some, to write some code for helping to, um, you know, facilitate our, our, um, our our um, program for the farm share and also to facilitate the day-to-day -day operations on the farm um, and some other cool things like that. So yeah, it's, it's a dream job to be honest. Oh, that's nice. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever we have a spill, Jess is the first person a that we call. A spill. <laughs> Whenever there's a leak, Jess is the first person we call. <laughs> that's, that, I normally am not, it's actually Justin who normally cleans up the leaks, but. <laughs> <laughs> So, so how Jess, did you, what's, oh, oh, yeah, oh, go you know ahead, that. Michael, go ahead, Michael. <laughs> yeah, there must be a delay going through, so sorry about that. I was just curious about your background, Jess, because, you know, the one thing that I've I've noticed is, you know, you're, you're writing software and you're also dealing with hardware systems and plumbing and, and, and all that. Are you just like a Swiss Army knife engineer or, you know, what, what, how, how did, what sort of training did you have to, to, to do this type of work? Um, well, I think, you know, as I grew growing up, I always loved solving engineering problems and just had a sort of engineering mindset when it came to, you know, fixing things around the house or even cooking or, you know, a million different things. Um, but I went to a liberal arts college, which uh, was the key because it's a very general, uh, it gives you a very general set of skills. My degree was in engineering, but it wasn't even specific engineering to anything. So I took all these electrical classes, these environmental classes, um, computer science classes, and sort of built a foundation for thinking about um, how systems work. Um, really, I think uh, systems thinking is the main thing I got out of that. Um, and then I immediately went and started working in the vertical farming space and kind of having this well-rounded foundation, got my hands on a lot of different things, started building out some more industry specific skills, learned, you know, how to, how to Google really well and, uh, and find <laughs> the right uh, websites to get parts and how they fit together and think about the systems that other people have already created and how we can leverage them to, um, achieve a desired outcome. Um, and I think, you know, that's sort of the foundation of, of, how I've learned to do the things that I think I've started to build up some expertise in. And um, yeah, that's that's about it. How much of your day is Googling things? <laughs> uh, a lot of my day is Googling things. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I think Google is a really powerful tool for if you know how to use it well for any person in any job. Um, that's a computer job, I guess, desk job. Um, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rob probably has some similar experiences with just spending a lot of time look like finding out how to do things through Google. Yeah, I think, I mean, if you if you want to make it like a little bit more grand, it's like, um, you know, before I started Farm One, I didn't know anything about hydroponics or, or anything, right? So, you know, you just start with being interested in something. And I think part of like learning how to program is, fundamentally about learning how to leverage existing technologies and match them together and exactly. you know, figure out sort of, so you're never really doing anything from scratch, right? And so part of being able to Google well, I think is knowing what to Google and 
how to distinguish good search results from others. But I, I mean, if I, you know, if I had to teach a kid like how to Google really well or how to do Pythagoras's theorem, I would do choose Googling any day, right? Because it gives you so much more power. Yeah. But anyway, I'll stop talking. Yeah. Right. <laughs> My Googling's just asking Jess questions on Slack that he then Googles and sends <laughs> yeah. me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let me Google that for you, as, yeah. as I say. Yeah. Jess, you're also doing your master's right now, aren't you? Yep. Can you share a little bit about that too? Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually just wrapping it up um, in sustainability management, um, which basically is the way that you integrate sustainability into um, an organization. And that could be a nonprofit organization or a for-profit organization. Um, and I think, you know, in order to do that, you have to have some science skills to understand the physical dimensions of sustainability, whether that's water systems, whether that's, um, you know, uh, climate, uh, all these different things that influence uh, businesses and organizations on a science level. But then also you have to know about, you know, sustainable marketing and um, what do what do people care about when they're looking at a product? Um, is it sustainability or is it its function? Th these types of things help you, uh, I guess, build up a, a system where you can help companies improve their sustainability in a very concrete way. Yeah. So not greenwashing. <laughs> no, we learn how to distinguish <laughs> greenwashing from uh, real sustainability, which, you know, is, is a skill. It's like um, learning how to read a science article. You know, it, it becomes like a after you after you look at these uh, marketing campaigns from companies about what they're doing with sustainability, you start to build an eye for what uh, has a real impact. And a lot of that's foundational on the on the science and you know what makes sense really so it's like reading a science article versus a press release you to be able to cut through to the truth yeah and you know the more i was making that reference because the more science articles you read the more you're able to understand the jargon and like um, figure out or distill like what they're trying to say because sometimes it's really confusing so when you think about you know obviously you chose this path of education. And it's one that I think, you know, as, as Ina and I were saying, it, it is a bit of a roller coaster of emotion sometimes, right? Like you, you know, you, the more you start to understand the world's issues, the more, you know, you maybe uh, get depressed about it, or you, the more that you, you know, see it as like this unsurmountable kind of thing. How do you kind of approach that when you, you know, every day you're basically learning more and more of the problems that we have uh, to solve? How do you kind of approach that emotionally? Well, I do learn about the problems a lot and it does get depressing, but you also learn about the solutions and the frameworks for building solutions. Um, I think different people have different weights on how to solve this problem, whether it's policy, whether it's technology, whether it's uh, activism. Um, I think Personally, I'm a technological optimist. Um, so I think that the smart use of technologies that integrate with nature and are um, you know, considering the long-term impacts, as we were talking about before with packaging, all these types of uh, solutions that are brought about by technology can um, get us to a place, hopefully, where we can sustain and be within our planetary boundaries. Um, and Getting very specific then with vertical farming, like what do you think about vertical farming and why are you involved in it? You know, when you can have so many other, you know, ways to contribute to, to climate change or other, other things. Uh, yeah, I, I, well, I'm very passionate about food systems in general. And so the, you know, there's a million different sustainability challenges in different industries, whether it's energy or, um, you know, tons of different things. but. I decided to focus on food systems because it's a just sort of innate passion that I have. Um, and I think vertical farming is, you know, obviously a hyper technological approach to farming. Um, the, you know, it's basically the, on the spectrum of no tech to all tech, it's all tech essentially. Um, and that's not to say that I always think the highest technological solution is the best, but I think, uh, 
within food systems, there's a big opportunity to use vertical farming for specific applications. Um, and I think Farm One has sort of been thinking about it in that way. And um, that's why I think it, you know, it's a really nice um, fit where we are in the market uh, mm -hmm. with the technology that we're using. And if you wanted to like, if you wanted to be uh, a naysayer about vertical farming, if you wanted to, ta to attack it from a sustainability point of view, what kind of things would you be critical about? And what do you think the industry needs to do better uh, to solve those kind of things? Yeah, I think, um, well, I think time will tell on some of the um, feasibility of vertical farming certain crops and, because ultimately the business that is operating the farm has to sustain itself. Um, but from a sustainability perspective, I think we need to get specific about conducting life cycle assessments for um, the production of certain crops and comparing those life cycle assessments to other methodologies for growing the same crops. Um, so, I mean, if you look around our farm, you see a lot of plastic um, and you see a lot of metal and you see LED lights. Um, there is all the stuff not only has, is energy intensive to manufacture, but comes around, comes into our facility from all around the world. Um, so I think, you know, compared to field agriculture, there's a lot more resource that goes into getting it up and running. But, you know, when you operate a, a field farm in an unsustainable way, you're often applying heavy amounts of chemicals. You're, um, you're escaping carbon from the soil into the air, contributing to um, global warming. So you know, there's a, a lot of different, um, di a lot of differences and a lot of things to compare between this methodology of farming. And I don't think that vertical farming um, is the sole solution for the problems that we face in our food system. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think the jury's still out whether or not, um, you know, this is a truly sustainable endeavor. I think it really depends on the specific application. How dare you, you Jess? The... <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. When you think about the, if you had to redesign the food system, you go half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, what, what would you, how would you, how would you reimagine that? Well, I think this um, trend of building field farms that are using regenerative practices is a really important large scale change that we need to uh, address. I think, um, you know, if all the farms in the United States used regenerative practices, we would uh, reduce our carbon emissions within the food industry by like 50% or something. Um, and that's like the food industry as a whole. So, uh, you know, that's a significant opportunity. And I think one that, you know, we aren't really addressing here at Farm One, but should be uh, taken seriously. But there's a whole other range of solutions um, after the food leaves the farm that we also need to think about, whether that's storage. I mean, we made some significant advancements in storage when you know canning came along and refrigeration, um, but I still think there's opportunity to reduce the amount of food waste by uh, you know improving technology in that area. I think there's also a tremendous amount of policy uh, changes that could be done to promote uh, greater food access, whether that's within the United States or uh, you know around the world. Um, I think you know technology exists in the United States for agriculture on the field at a high degree, but that technology isn't necessarily distributed equally uh, in areas that might benefit from it most. Um, yeah, so these are just like some of the issues, but you know, you, you could talk about this for a whole nother 100 episode podcast, which I'm sure there are 10 of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Michael, do you have any so other questions for Jess? Yeah. So Jess, when, when, you know, in the vertical farming industry, um, it, it, we often talk about, you know, using X amount percent less land, using X percent less water, 
uh, emitting fewer greenhouses, ga greenhouse gases and that type of thing. So if what you're saying is we need to look at sort of the entire cycle of the impact and of, of, you know, of the entire supply chain in the food system, um, you know, is that just is that greenwashing? Right. Or is that is that real when we think about vertical farming and when people are, are thinking about getting into the industry or consumers that are, are thinking of shopping from a farm like Farm One? Um, you know, are these real? How should they think about this? Yeah, I think, um, you know, for just to focus on one specific uh, parameter that you talked about, which was water, I think, um, you know, it is true that recycling, recycling water through our system saves water and thus the plants require less, well, they still need as much water, but they, the overall amount of water in the system compared to a field is a lot less and there's less runoff. But I think, you know, the benefits of that are more detailed. For instance, in we, our farms in the New York area, and there really isn't a huge water shortage here, like there is in out west, where there's a tremendous amount of drought. And so um, we're essentially replacing the production out west with production in uh, New York, made possible by being indoors and vertical and um, using LEDs. So um, I think the metric there is not that we're X percentage more efficient with water, but that, you know, the, where we're using the water, it is less, but it's also in a more um, sustainable way. If, if we're producing, using a vertical farm out west, then you, that claim would be more um, accurate, which I think, uh, you know, it goes back to the point where it's all in the details of where the farm is, how the farm operates, what crops it produces, what customers it serves. Uh, it's a case by case basis. So how do we deal with that when, you know, we're we're looking at these factory farms that are opening, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of square feet of, of growing area? Uh, the, the energy usage must just be immense. I mean, how, are renewables at a place where, you know, economically and also are we producing enough to be able to supply that? Is that uh, how should the industry think of that? Well, you know, renewables is a whole another topic, but I think these farms that uh, are, you know, factory farms producing a large amount of leafy greens most of the time, um, you know, can use renewable sources of energy and can reduce the burden on um, water resources. I think um, the the challenge is making it so that uh, the economics makes sense for those companies, but also. Um, yeah, like how long those com those facilities can operate for if it's 10 years versus 50 years with the same equipment that makes a big difference um so you know i don't i don't think that those are necessarily uh problematic or you know uh the solution i just think it really depends on the details which is not a great answer but uh, <laughs> it really it's really i think the truth it's a can of worms it is a can of worms yeah, yeah but i think the you know partly the point the you're making is as an industry, as a nascent industry of vertical farming, we have to be okay with that complexity. I think that the days where you just say to the consumer, oh, we're 95% more efficient or something, those days are numbered, you know, because the moment you do look into the details, maybe it's better, maybe it's worse, but it, it's just, it's not that simple, you know? And I think as consumers, certainly I know that the people who buy from us, but you know, certainly people who go to farmers markets, people who care about their food, that kind of thing. People uh, do want to know behind the label. They want to get the full details. And so I, I think we have to, as an industry, get get better at that because I think it has been too simplistic historically. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying that there isn't a way to compare apples to apples, but, you know, I think we can draw from the field of sustainability at much more developed in much more developed industries to use uh, standard practices for life cycle assessments and for cost benefit analyses to to you know be able to look at the environmental impacts um you know yeah. there's a whole reporting structure for sustainability called gri that i don't think uh really any company within the vertical farming industry has produced um so yeah i mean we we need to get more specific and as rob said like i think uh you can't just make a blanket statement like we use 95 percent less water because it is a bit of a greenwashing scenario in that case. 
Michael, any other questions for Jess? Yeah, so if someone wanted to be Jess at a vertical farming company, aside from reading a ton of science articles and ignoring press releases and any form of advertising, um, what would your advice be? I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of products online that can give you the opportunity to build your own little system and experiment. I think once you get your hands dirty and you start connecting pumps and, and tubes and trying to grow plants, um, one, you'll figure out if this is something you really want to do. <laughs> and two, you'll really gain an appreciation for just how the, the hydroponic systems work. And I think if you were to do that and then come into an interview at a vertical farm and have sort of this more nuanced perspective, the people you're talking to will have, will, will appreciate that because, um, you know, I think when you explain vertical farming, it can make a lot of sense and you can say, oh, okay, yeah, you stack up and use lights and, but understanding the details is really critical. Um, and I think it's pretty low cost and easy to start getting some experience, just getting your hands on it. Um, there isn't like a really established academic program or anything like that to, to learn about vertical farming or really hydroponics, um, although there are some. Um, so um, I think that's a good way to get started. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for answering our questions, Jess, and being- You had to, you had no choice. <laughs> and being our guest this they week. They forced me to do this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the last segment that we're gonna go into is called Rose, Thorn, and Bud. <laughs> So during this segment, we'll ask our interview guests to share one thing that they loved this past week, which is their rose, one thing that was a little bit bad this week, that's their thorn, and one thing that they're excited for, which is their bud. So Jess, what's your rose, thorn, and bud? Um, well, my rose is on Wednesday, two days from now, Ava and I are having our anniversary, so it's our jave anniversary. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's sure what our, our Jave anniversary, Jess and Ava anniversary. Uh, uh, I missed uh, that. So uh, <laughs> this is a creative side of the engineer there flowing out of you. <laughs> exactly. Um, the thorn is this news that Trump is trying to lease land in uh, the Arctic for uh, extracting oil resources on conservation land, like two days before he's supposed to leave office. So I just like. And very frustrated by that. It's just like, it seems like he's just trying to create as much damage as he can while he can. Um, and the, my bud is that as we continue to develop our subscription business, I've been here at the farm um, at least once a week, building more levels so that we can support more customers, grow more uh, varieties. And we also have some uh, kind of cool research varieties in the mix that we hope to share with our customers um, over the coming weeks. So I think. Uh, it'll be really exciting to start building on our, um, you know, the crops that we're offering and um, building up more space. And it's, it's just fun. Amazing. Thanks so much, Jess. And thank you all for tuning in to this week's episode. Be sure to like and subscribe to our Farm One podcast and give us a shout of what you liked. Bye. 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 Bye.